we can hear you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Just wanted to check that. Okay, so um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the a joint uh, National Energy Research Institute and Otago Energy Research Centre seminar. It's a long title. Um, this is going to be a hybrid in-person and online event. Um, so bear with us with the technology. Um, so our speaker today is um, Professor Craig Roger, who, um, so Craig holds the Beverly Chair in Physics in the Department of Physics at, um, at Otago University. His research is primarily, primarily in space weather and atmospheric electricity. Um, but in 2020, he led a successful proposal to MB for a five-year, $15 million research program titled Solar Tsunamis, Space Weather Prediction and Risk Mitigation for New Zealand's Energy Infrastructure. Um, so this program aims to investigate um, how solar explosions impact human technology and in particular the New Zealand electricity grid. So this is a, a very relevant topic for us. Um, and I will hand it over to Craig to tell us more about his research program and um, his research findings so far. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much for those people who are online and those people who are in the room. Um, I was really keen to have just a couple of people in the room so I had some human faces and not just a, bank, a bunch of black Zoom boxes for this talk. And so thank you to everybody who was able to attend in all ways. So as Michael said, We've recently been successful with a very large uh, MBIE chunk of change. Um, and today's talk is to try and give you some background as to why we are doing this sort of research and um, what our goals for the big picture research project is. So, um, okay. So first of all, we need to define what space weather is because lots of people will not come across this phrase. So space weather is a technical term which is used to describe how processes occurring in space impact human technology. And that might be satellites that are flying around, it might be things on the ground. Almost all of space weather starts with the sun and things that are triggered in the sun setting off processes in space which can negatively affect technology. And in our modern world, where so much of our um, economic, social, health, and quality of life depends on our technology working, this becomes very important. So here's a nice graphic showing you examples of many different uh, techn technological systems that can be impacted by space weather, whether it's satellites, um, aeroplanes, that could be both in terms of communication systems on the aeroplanes working, radiation doses that people on those planes as they're flying around, uh, satellites having uh, short-term problems or simply dying, uh, but there's also impacts on power systems and pipelines. And I'm going to be particularly focused on the power line issue in my talk today, the power systems issue. Now, why do we care about this? A really good example is to start by going back to March 1989, where there was an unusually big geomagnetic storm. So a disturbance in the Earth's magnetic field. For many of us, this is equivalent to saying something like, there was a disturbance of the force, okay? But essentially, the magnetic field of the Earth was uh, changing rapidly with time. And during this period, a few days in March 1989, the auroral zone, which is normally sitting at very high latitudes in places like, well, Antarctica or Canada or Scandinavia, got pushed south a long way. And this was really an unusually big storm. So big that aurora was being seen in places like Texas and Florida in the United States. The most... Uh, the equator would most point that I've come aware of for the Southern Hemisphere is a place called Exmouth in Australia, which is more than a thousand kilometers north of Perth. So there would have been aurora seen in Auckland. There would have been aurora seen from Cape Reina, 
And there would have been an aurora seen most of the way to New Caledonia, New Mere. Not quite. Probably not quite. But that's big. That's an unusually big event. But one of the things I want to stress is that this is not what we're going to later call an extreme event. This is something that might happen every few decades, not every few hundred years. But it was a big event. When you look at the changing magnetic field in North America, there was a short time period where the, the rate of change of the magnetic field on the ground spiked. So here we've got a map of, these are ground-based measurements turned into a map showing uh, the, the, the rate of change in the magnetic field at 742, 743, 744, and 745. And there was this rapid pulse of large magnetic field changes all across uh, the, the, the Canada region. It turned out that this was not good for the power system in Quebec. So the, the, in the, in the um, province of Quebec, it's a little bit like New Zealand. Somewhere where not many people live, there are lots of hydro dams. They generate lots and lots of power. They send the power to where all the people live. And indeed, they also, in their case, they send a whole lot of it to the United States as well. So they have this power network. It was functioning fine until that pulse of magnetic field changes. So the first thing happened is that in this corridor here, where there's a whole lot of big hydro dams up there, within 60 seconds, a bunch of the um, internal power systems tripped out. Now that just means that the safety systems went, something bad is happening, we'll pull them out of the network. Okay? Because of that, this side of the power network effectively started to decouple from this side of the power network, remembering that all of the system is trying to send power down here to Montreal, Quebec City, where all the people live. In the next six seasons, the power starts to oscillate, the amount of power and the frequency of the power. And then within 20 seconds of that, the entire network has collapsed and there's a blackout. Okay, now, if you add up all the times, this takes about 90 seconds. So it turns out that in about one and a half minutes, the Hydro-Quebec power system, which is effectively the power system for the province of Quebec, went from operating stably, very small things happening, that the people in the control room were going, mm, okay, we've got to do a little bit of management, we've got a little, little, little bit of management, to a blackout, no juice at all. And it's a bad thing. So, it was actually 92 seconds. So, um, 9 million people were left without electricity. For most places, this involved a blackout of about nine hours. Now, there's lots of electrical engineers who think that that number there is amazing. Heroic that the electrical power system in Quebec could be brought back from a black start in only nine hours. No significant actual damage to equipment in this event just that the network got pulled down. There were locations that were in the dark for days, and it turns out that uh, in Quebec, at least in this time period, electricity was one of the main forms of heating, and of course this occurred during a bad ice storm, because that's what happens in life. And there were also um, issues in, down in the United States, including some equipment damage, but they managed to avoid cascading outages. So if we look at the bits that I've described, there was an intense geomagnetic storm. There were rapid changes in the magnetic field seen on the ground. There was strong aurora visible. The electrical system collapsed and there was a blackout. I want to try and tell you about how all of these joined together and why we might care about it. As I said to you, the source of space weather is the sun. And we generally view the sun as an unchanging thing. If you go outside now and stand in the sun, and it's such a nice day, so you should when this is over. You sit there and you go, oh, the sun is nice and warm and is shining upon me. And you think of the sun as unchanging. And the only reasons that we normally think that the sun is changing is because, you know, weather, clouds get in the way. But the sun is actually a bit more complicated than that in general. It's a big burning ball of plasma with intense magnetic fields, and it's very active. 
mostly in ways that we don't notice and generally don't have to care about. Generally. In practice, the sun is forcing the Earth's system. Now, the normal way that we think about that is just through gravity. The sun is very, very, has high gravitational attraction. The Earth orbits the sun in a lovely stable orbit, and therefore we end up with a stable climate, except for humanity. Okay, the good stuff. But the sun is actually reaching out and touching the Earth in other ways. The outer atmosphere of the sun is so insanely hot, 10 million degrees, that it is boiling out into space. Just a little bit. It's like it's slowly evaporating. It's all right. It's been doing it for 10 billion years. It's going to happen for a long time now. Five billion years. Um, and th there's what we call the solar wind coming out from the sun, gently brushing past the Earth at about 350 kilometers a second when it's quiet, carrying the magnetic field of the sun out into space. So the magnetic field of the sun is actually reaching out and gripping the Earth. But not here on the surface, because we have our own magnetic field that's fighting back. So you can see, this is the magnetic field of the Earth. For those people online, this is the magnetic field of the Earth. And you can see it's compressed on the sunward facing side and swept out, blown backwards on the night side of the Earth. That's the influence of the sun's magnetic field and the solar wind, compressing the Earth's magnetic field on the day side, sweeping it out. We're like a rock in a stream. So it's just like fluid flow, really, except there's magnetic fields involved. Now, when the sun is quiet, this is the situation that we end up interacting with. The issue is that sometimes the sun is active. And in its most active times, it can explode, creating solar explosions, which are the biggest explosions in the modern solar system. Yeah, you know, titanic explosions in terms of the energy release. Not hydrogen bombs, hundreds of millions of hydrogen bombs exploding in one place at one time. And it produces a whole lot of uh, effects like X-ray flares and the ejection of hot solar protons and the ejection of material from the inside the sun, which can then trigger geomagnetic storms. Now, I'm not going to talk about all of these. I do in some of my public talks, but today we're focused on the impact of the power system. And so I'm only going to talk about some subsets of this. I want to particularly focus on this phenomenon that we call solar tsunami. So just a uh, request from the audience yep. to use the mouse so they can see where yep. you're pointing to. That's cool. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's quite nice. Are you all right? I should. Um, so a solar tsunami is not its is not the technical name. They're referred to as coronal mass ejections. But New Zealanders know what tsunami are, and these come from the sun. It's a good way of explaining things too. So a coronal mass ejection or a solar tsunami is a chunk of the sun's material that is thrown out into space during a solar explosion. Um, and it's a very small fraction of the total mass of the sun. Again, it's been happening for 5 billion years. It's not a big deal. It is, however, billions of tons of material. And the sun is so unbelievably big and fat that it can, those these things can be true. Billions of tons worth of material can come off the sun quite regularly, and it's a tiny fraction of the sun's mass. Now, we nowadays, actually for the last 25 years, we've got satellites out in space staring at the sun, watching, watching the sun do this. Now, the sun is very, very bright, so this is hard, because what we're effectively looking at is clouds of gas, hot gas, coming off the sun. So here's a movie of this happening, and I'm going to just pause it. So I can show you what's happening. So here is the sun. That's just a photograph of the sun that's been put there so that we know that the sun is under there. There is a disk hiding the sun because the sun, looks, the sun is so bright that we put this blocker in front of the sun. And then there's this dark thing here. That's the arm holding the blocker in place. This is not high technology, but it works. If you look at the old movies, they didn't use to put a little image of the sun in the middle of the blocker. Nowadays they do because we can. So, and now we can see the stars behind the sun and the gases coming from the sun. If I let the movie play, boom, you can see what we call a full halo. That is evidence of a solar tsunami heading towards the Earth. 
And the way to think about this is, imagine I have a shotgun and I load it up with um, shot and I point it to the side and pull the trigger, you would see a, a, a cloud of shot, if your eyes are very fast, heading off on the side. I point it the other way and pull the trigger, you see a cloud of shot. Now, if I'm a bad man and I point it at you and pull the trigger, you will see a ring of shot coming in. And that's what we're looking for. That's a full halo. That's a coronal mass ejection that is heading towards Earth. Now, of course, life is more complicated because the cloud is magnetized. It feels the magnetic field of the solar wind, so it doesn't go in a straight line. It follows the path that the solar wind has taken, which is not a straight line. It follows a road we can't see. So working out if this coronal mass ejection is going to hit Earth is non-trivial. But it is part of our problem, and it takes about a day or two. So it's moving fast for something that has to go 150 million kilometers, but it still means that we have some warning. What happens when this sort of thing arrives on Earth? Just like the solar wind was gripping the magnetic field of the Earth, now imagine that I take a gigantic pillow, a billion tons of magnetized plasma, and poof, the Earth with it. It's going to get crunched down. And here's an extreme example of that happening. You can see the magnetic field of the Earth beforehand in its nice stable state. This is for an extreme uh, solid tsunami, something that will be at the 1 in 100, 1 in 200 year level. The magnetic field of the Earth starts from its quite stable state. This is uh, magnetic hydrodynamics modeling from NASA. And then boom, we get pushed down, squeezed down. The magnetic field of the Earth squeezed down to a much smaller space. Now, one consequence of this is good stuff. We'll have cool aurora. Aurora is happening almost all of the time, but way south of us. And it's only, generally, when a solar tsunami comes along and causes a big geomagnetic storm that the aurora gets pushed towards New Zealand. An okay, fairly common storm, you get the land of glowing skies and you're seeing aurora at Stewart Island or Southland. Bit more grunty, did eat it. Bit more grunty, Christchurch. Really grunty, fairly unusual, Auckland. Okay, so the sun, but here's some, now a lovely time lapse movie of Aurora scene in Dunedin. That's November 2001. Or another cool movie, a relatively unusual view of the Aurora as seen by the International Space Station. They're looking down on the Aurora. Most of, the, most of the light emission in the aurora is occurring at altitudes of about 120 to 150 kilometers. The International Space Station is more like 350 kilometers altitude, so they look down. And generally they try not to fly through it, because the aurora is a stream of hot electrons and protons falling out of space, striking the Earth's atmosphere, energizing the atmosphere and causing it to glow. It's a thing you don't want to fly an expensive piece of electronics with people living inside through. The International Space Station does not go over the poles for that reason. It hugs low energy. Okay, so why do we care about solar tsunami, coronal mass ejections arriving? It's particularly the changing magnetic fields. And so I need to take you back to what is, I hope, high school physics. Once upon a time, there was a physicist called Michael Faraday in the United Kingdom. He was incredibly famous and he was really well known for giving great demonstrations in his talks and lectures that were really insightful. And even today, it's one of the things that all physicists really think is important to give good quality demonstrations in our lectures. Okay, Michael Faraday was and is sufficiently famous that he is still on the 20 pound note in the UK. That's not bad for someone who has been dead for 150 years-ish. One of the things he identified was so-called Faraday's law of induction. And that tells us that a moving magnet will uh, a moving magnet will produce a changing magnetic field, and that changing magnetic field will induce an electrical current. So here's a great animation made to me made for me by Paul Muir of the physics department. Where you have a changing a moving magnet, and it induces a current in an electric conductor. Now we can all do this with uh, very simple equipment in a lecture setting. The interesting thing is that this is happening on a huge scale with the power grid. 
because humanity have been busy bees and have spread electrical conductors all over the world, particularly in the form of electrical transmission lines, power lines. We have set up electrical conductors. So what happens when a solar tsunami comes along? It squeezes the magnetic field of the Earth. We get a rapid change of a magnetic field on the surface of the Earth, which is a changing magnetic field. Okay, then that will lead to time-varying currents in the ionosphere and magnetosphere, which will lead to a time-varying magnetic field at the surface of the Earth. That will then induce an electric field at the surface of the Earth. Now, this is a really important point. The size of the electric field is not very big. We use units of volts per kilometer. So, if I'm standing on the surface of the Earth during the, one of these events, there will be a voltage difference, an electrical potential difference between my feet, and the current will flow from one foot through my nether regions to the other foot. But the current will be very, very small because the units are volts per kilometer and I can't spread my legs very far. Okay? Human beings worry about lightning because the current, the voltages, the voltage differences are really high. Cows really worry about lightning because their feet are a long way away from each other. But we need things that are many kilometers long, tens, hundreds of kilometers long before we're going to care for the space weather impact, which is a power network. Now, if you happen to have solar panels on your roof and a home electricity system, this is not something for you to worry about. This is something that always comes up in public talks. Okay? There will be other reasons for worrying, but you are unlikely to have a power issue because of a rapidly changing magnetic field, because the voltage across your power system, which is probably, you know, 50 meters across, will be teeny tiny. What happens if we have this electric field? We'll have a voltage difference between the earthling points of the network, and that will cause currents to flow up through one earthling point, through the power line, and down through other earthling points. And the issue is, that in a functioning electrical power network, those earthing points are the main grid power transformers. So currents flow through those grid transformers and they're not meant to be there. The transformers are not designed to have those currents present and they don't like them. They lead to things like a half cycle saturation, which involves producing harmonics, and to produce instability in the network, it was the harmonics that ended up killing Hydro-Quebec, but no actual damage to the equipment. It just pulled the whole network apart, but they could put it back together again. If, however, the saturation is bad enough, you start getting hot spots inside your transformer, hot spots very bad, at which point you can end up with burnout, and then you get actual equipment damage. We know this can happen in rare big storms. We suspect, but we don't know, that a succession of little storms can cause a bit of stress, a bit of stress, a bit of stress, and then you hit it just a little bit harder and it goes and dies. We think, <laughs> but that's an area that's actually an active research here. What are the pathways to damage? Well, there are sort of three that we tend to focus on. Um, you get saturation of the transformers producing harmonics. That, uh, and harmonics aren't meant to be there, and then the protection, they're a sign of bad things in the network, so the protection systems jump into play, start pulling equipment out. If you pull too much of your generation out, you've got, you know, you've got a whole lot of people saying, I need power to keep warm. And then you say, oh dear, we're just going to turn off a whole lot of the generation. You get a blackout because there's not enough power for the people. That was what? A month and a half ago in the North Island? <laughs> where there wasn't enough generation available to provide people's needs. You could get stray fields in the transformers leading to heating and damage, which can lead to the transformer tripping out, but actually burning out, which could lead to power shortage and a blackout. And you can also have uh, increases in reactive power. Now, unfortunately, it's complex. It, it, whether this will happen is complex. It depends on how severe the storm is. The design of the individual transformers, we think, and of course that's, it's not a state secret, it's a commercial secret. I mean, everybody who builds these transformers has their way of doing it. 
Where is it within the grid relative to the coastline? What is it plugged into? How old is it? Because we think that over time it will age, possibly due to other geomagnetic storms, possibly just because age is bad for all of us. What is the ground like? What direction are the power lines? And then what's happened in the past? So there's a bunch of factors we need to consider. This sort of space weather, geomagnetically induced current, because those are what those currents are called, geomagnetically induced currents. The space weather risk to a power grid is clearly a global thing. It starts with the sun slapping the earth and starting global level processes. But most of these pathways to damage depend on local issues. Our power system, which way do our power lines run? What is our ground like? So it needs to be solved at a regional or national level. It needs to be considered. And for some countries, the answer may be not really a big deal. For some countries, it clearly is. And it needs to be considered locally. Hopefully, as part of global scientific collaboration so we can learn from each other. Because that's always the best. Here are some examples of not harmonics destabilizing a network, burnouts. This transformer, my finger, Craig, this transformer is in a place called Three Mile Island, you may have heard of it, in New Jersey. And during the March 1989 storm, that transformer was burnt out. The nuclear power plant was fine, <laughs> thankfully. October 2009, this image from South Africa. Now that really got a lot of the international community going. Because up to that point, our, our, our mental belief was that this was a high latitude problem. The Canadians, the Swedes, those Russians, it's their problem. But for most of the world, we don't see the aurora very often. It's not likely to come out and hurt us. And then the South Africans start reporting issues. Now, I have to admit, there are people in the community who don't believe that this is space where they've produced issues in South Africa. They think it's maintenance and some other issues that ESCOM in South Africa have some problems with. But it was eye-opening, and some of the research being done in South Africa is really suggestive and really interesting. On a regional scale, we've already talked about what can happen on a regional, regional scale. The loss of a hydro Quebec power network is a very good example of what can happen. What about on a really big scale and for an extreme storm? So a little bit more than 10 years ago, a group of researchers got together to say, what would happen for the United States, only the United States, in an extreme magnetic storm? And they said, well, we think that we would burn out a few hundred of the main grid transformers in the United States, but only in certain parts of the United States, because it's a bit dependent on the ground and it's a bit dependent on the magnetic field changes. So mostly here around um, Washington State and Oregon and the East Coast into the Midwest, so only about 130 million people. Because these transformers, you don't go to the warehouse and buy them. You don't go to JCAR and buy them. You order them and they build them for you. And when they're ready, they send it to you. So if hundreds of grid transformers are destroyed, it's going to take a long time to get them replaced and fixed. And the estimate they thought is, well, it might take a year or more to rebuild the US power network. And the cost they thought for the first year would be about 2 trillion US dollars. Now, that's a very controversial number. Some people think it might be as low as half a trillion. Some people think it might be as high as 4 trillion. All I wish to ask you is to emphasize the fact that all of these numbers start with a T4 trillion which are a very big numbers. I also personally, I need a lot of science fiction. I sort of wonder if you took our, our electricity for 25% of the United States and said, wait a year, we'll bring back electricity in a year. How much is it gonna look like Mad Max movies after that year? I don't know. And I don't think we should do the experiment. Now, these sort of reports still have a lot of interest in the United States because suddenly this looked like a national security issue. And so at the end of the Obama administration, a national space weather strategy and a national space weather action plan was launched by the White House. You may be aware that the president after President Obama really didn't like anything President Obama did and canceled. Have you heard of cancel culture? Yes. Trump went away and canceled virtually everything that President Obama did. But not this. 
This kept running and expanding and becoming more active. Because of national security? Maybe. Because no one told him? Maybe. But anyway, there's been a lot of developments in the US where laws have been passed saying that the commercial power operators need to work with the scientists to start thinking about the risks for the United States and how they can get around it for the United States. You can also look at a report um, from the UK Royal Academy of Engineering and they made a report on extreme space weather. They were particularly focused on a storm. The biggest storm that we know of was 1859, we call it the Carrington event. And um, they tried to estimate what they think would happen in their power grid. Their estimates were that it wouldn't be so bad. They'd have a few burnouts, but only, they'd only lose, um, you know, 13 of their main grid transformers. They could, be, they could be replaced in only weeks from their spares, because they have some spares, and the blackouts would only be less than a day long. I know a lot of people who think that this report is far too conservative in a happy way. Like, it's not going to be so bad, but the important thing is that people have to look at it in this situation from their country's risk. And uh, the UK has a national risk register that people are allowed to look at and see what was on it. And space weather was added to the National Risk Register. And because it was added to the National Risk, Risk Register, the UK Meteorological Office, which is their version of the Met Service, was tasked by government, the UK government, and funded by the UK government, to go away and start providing space weather forecasts for the UK population and industry. So they took it pretty seriously. That sort of thing's been happening in the US for um, well, uh, decades. Um, there was almost a nuclear war in the 60s, Julia. And so since then, people have paid space weather quite a lot of. Then the sun went bang, threw out a whole lot of radio waves. Um, they jammed a whole lot of the radars that were looking to see the Soviet missiles and bombers coming over the horizon. The US military thought that the fact that their radars were not working was because the Soviets were jamming them before they came over the horizon. They sent the pilots and the bombers and started going. And then the, the, the brand new space weather unit in Chain Mountain like inside the control center in the mountain went, wait a minute, the sun's just done something really bad, it probably explains this. Let's just wait a while and see what happens. Oh, and by the way, this was just around the time of one of the Arab, Arab Israeli wars. And so everyone was feeling slightly tense. And then the sun did something stupid. Of course, the sun's not a person. Okay, what about New Zealand? Well, we can look back in time. And we can look at our historical thing. There's this archive called Papers Past. National Library has, has digitized a whole lot of our historic newspapers. And so you can go away and look for cool things. Don't look for Aurora, because like every 10th ship was called the Aurora. And if a ship visited New Zealand in the mid 1800s, it was written about in a paper who the captain was, what it was carrying, where it was going next. Aurora Australis is a bad thing. Okay, so here's a report from, eight, uh, from 1882. A brilliant aurora was seen at Port Chalmers on Monday. Um, it was followed to its midnight by heavy rains. The same thing was noticed in Diddy. Now, I find it slightly stunning that people are saying, people saw lights in the sky in Port Chalmers. Oh, they did it in Eden too. <laughs> like, the Eden Port Chalmers are pretty close. If you do something in the sky over Port Chalmers, something significant. Okay, they may not have known that it was 150 dollars, LG. Um, the same storm, it was found necessary uh, this noon owing to electrical atmospheric disturbances of a most unusual nature to refuse telegraphic work for all stations. So the telegraph was the internet of the day, covered the country and indeed the world with cables, and you could change the voltage on the cable and you could see Morse code and send telegrams to one another. Hello! Space weather event comes along, lots of changing magnetic fields, lots of changing electric fields, the telegraph system stops working. Oh, and this I particularly like from the same storm, the city fire bells rang out an alarm last night, the watchman being deluded by Aurora Australis. Now that's really important. Not only was Aurora occurring in Auckland, it was bright enough that you could see the colours, the colour red, so the watchman thought that it was fire. Would have been a big storm. Okay, um, here's another example where the 
reports from all over New Zealand of electrical disturbances. What about the biggest geomagnetic storm on record? Now, this is called the Carrington event. There are uh, two places in the world that I know of that were making scientific ground-based magnetic field measurements, one of which was in the UK. So this is the British Geological Survey pictures from the Greenwich Observatory of the magnetograms from 1859. It's called the Carrington event because a physicist called Richard Carrington was sketching pictures of sunspots. He was looking at the sun. He was projecting an image of the sun onto a piece of paper through a piece of cloth. The piece of cloth was says the sun is too damn bright. Right? And then he was sketching the sunspots he could see. And as he was doing this, suddenly the edge of one of the sunspots started to brighten and there was this flash of white light. He thought that a rip had occurred in his, screen, in his cloth screen, but he could later go away and say, there is no rip. He saw a solar flare. He saw the explosion of the sun. And a day later, there was a roar of being seen all over the world. And he wrote an article in the Transactions of the Royal Society, London, to link these two together. And the prison, president of the Royal Society said, you're crazy. And effectively tried to suppress that word. But anyway, we now recognize Carrington having, uh, done, having observed that. And if we look at uh, the Magnetic Observatory observations, uh, I think these ones are actually from Bombay. Uh, the British Empire, when they got going, you know how they went around the world and put flags all sorts of places and said, this is ours. Not long afterwards, they started making weather measurements in those places and also making magnetic field measurements. So we end up with these archives. Anyway, we know some time periods there should have been nice aurora due to this extreme geomagnetic storm. What about New Zealand? Well, yes, there is an article from 1858 um, in the Taranaki Herald talking about aurora seen reflected in the snow of what we now call Mount Taranaki. At that stage, they were mostly calling Mount Egmont. Uh, the end is sort of interesting. It's got a little bit of casual racism in it. The cause of the aurora, even with our gigantic, our gigantic strides in physical science, is little known. Conjecture alone is left to us. It is generally attributed to electric and magnetic influences. And Dr. Faraday concedes the Earth's equilibrium is restored by the aurora conveying the electricity from the poles to the equator. In New Zealand, however scant may be our information gathered from natives, the aurora australis may be assumed of rare occurrence. In Iceland, the aurora is gone. Now, you know, there's the casual racism that you would probably expect from 1859. I do like the fact, though, that in a provincial newspaper in New Zealand, they name drop Michael Faraday and they don't have to explain who he is. Which is sort of like Lady Gaga or whoever the captain of the All Blacks is right now. You just say that and everyone's expected to know who the hell they are. Uh, there was also Aurora seen in Auckland. They had a nice weather report for some historic reason. Uh, yes, northwest winds, moderate till evening, Aurora scene. Okay, what we didn't end up with was disruptions to our uh, telegraph system, which really surprised me. But it's because we hadn't installed it yet. The first telegraph was installed uh, uh, to link the port of Littleton in Christchurch in 1862 and the port of Port Chalmers in Dunedin in 1862 as well. But by 1876, we had a line to Sydney. This really got going fast. It was big technology. And it turns out that we are one of the few places in the world where we've had transformer damage. So in 2001, there was a Big-ish geomagnetic storm, not particularly big by global standards, but big-ish. Alarms rang all over the South Island. Equipment in Christchurch got tripped out, and one of the transformers in Halfway Bush in Sydney to Dunedin was burnt out. Two million dollar replacement costs. Not big mickeys, but not the sort of thing you want to have on regular. So Michael was kind enough to mention that we have recently been funded with a five-year research program. Before that, we had the little one where we tried to work out, we had a, 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 which was also called solar tsunamis, where we tried to work out was there a risk, was there a hazard to New Zealand? The current one is more about what we would do about the hazards. So let me give you a little bit of background information. We were trying to understand the occurrence in the New Zealand network 
test the mitigation protocols that Transpower already has and predict the likely output of a severe storm. New Zealand is unusually blessed. It turns out that Transpower is making measurements of DC currents, which are effectively telling us about the GIC all through the lower South Island, and there's a few in Wellington as well. Why? Uh, why? Because we have this thing called the Cook Strait Cable, which provides power from our hydro dams up to the North Island. And while you might think that the sensible thing to do was to send power up one of the wires, and then electrons have to have a return path, and so there'd be another wire coming back, and there is, some of the time it's easier and cheaper to squirt the electrons into the ground. They have electrodes, and they pop up again at Benmore and complete the loop. Most of them, it turns out about 5%, decide to pop up in other transformers across the South Island and then travel across the power network, across the power network to complete the loop. And because Transpower is a bit worried about that, they have this monitoring equipment all over the country and they've stored the data since 2001. So when we started this research project in 2015, we got 14 years worth of observations. Hardly any other nation in the world has any measurements like that. Um, we were making comparisons with New Zealand's official magnetometer, which is just outside of Christchurch and operated by GNS. Uh, here's a plot showing the currents measured in, um, in Islington near Christchurch and compared it with magnetic field changes. But the currents are induced by the rate of change of the magnetic field. If I plot the rate of change of the magnetic field and the currents that are measured, you can see that they beautifully correspond. When we go away and try and understand these things, I particularly, one example I always like to show is from St. Patrick's Day storm in 2015, the 13th biggest storm in 15 years, but so recently that we have really good data coverage. You can go away and you can see, here's the magnetic field, very boring, and then bam, there's this coronal mass ejection squeezing the magnetic field down, this big step. And then, oh, we're going crazy, as stuff happens. You look at the rate of change in the magnetic field, nothing, 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 huge, short pulse, and then lots of activity. Um, in Dunedin, one of the locations where we've had actual damage, we've got almost 50 amps of unplanned current. Now, 50 amps is lots. If you were holding the wire when 50 amps were going through, you would be very sad after that. Certainly in hospital, possibly in a coffin. Not good. You don't want 50 amps going through. Um, and you can see there's a sudden shock and then lots of slower processes that can last hours afterwards, some of which can be quite big. But if you go away and you look at this is a colour scale, how the currents vary across the South Island, and one of the nice things is we've got measurements from multiple transformers. You can see, if you just focus here, you've got places where the currents are 30, 40 amps in the middle of the South Island, just down the road, they can be five. Really strongly depends on the ground and how the power grid's plugged together. Again, we have to solve this problem locally. Now, one of the cool things that we did in our initial project is we got access to some new measurements that Transpower had on harmonic distortion. So the New Zealand power grid operates at 50 hertz. Imagine it like a, a sine wave that's going up and down 50 times a second. A stressed transformer will cause that sine wave to be a little bit distorted, not a perfect shape. And you can measure that as harmonic distortion. It turns out that GIC, these stress transformers, produce even order harmonic distortion. That's very unusual for electrical engineers, very unusual. And if we go away and look at the even order harmonic distortion during an event, so here's nothing happening. Here's a map of all the GIC measurements in New Zealand. That's the little red dashes, but they're all at the bottom of the South Island. Before a big storm and, and very quiet conditions all across the country for the hot harmonic distortion. And then you look during the storm, we see big currents, not particularly in Dunedin, but there are no measurements in the North Island for the geomagnetically induced current, but we did have measurements of harmonic distortion. And so we see big harmonic distortion in the lower South Island. We see big harmonic distortion in Tasman heading up towards Walbrook. We see harmonic distortion in Talanaki. Now this is, not an, this is not a huge storm. 
And these levels of harmonic distortion are not scary. But they are telling us that there are transformers in the North Island during this not scary storm saying, I am mildly stressed. And during an extreme storm, they will probably not be mildly stressed, they'll be deeply upset. That opened a lot of eyes amongst trans people who started to see impacts in the North Island. In their day. And then we've also predicted what an extreme storm would be like. So this is from the Islington measurements near Christchurch. The 25 biggest storms, they sort of, the intensity of the magnetic, of the currents is sort of linearly related to the rate of change of the field. And so then I'm going to extrapolate to an extreme storm. I have to work out what is an extreme storm like. So I can go turn to my friends in the UK who have taken historic data and worked out what they think an extreme storm would be like. And is that valid? Well, it turns out that Wellington, in a magnetic latitude sense, is the same as London, and Dunedin is the same as Edinburgh, which is really cute. I really like that. But it gives us some values for extreme storms. And so a one in 100 year storm for Islington would be about 450 amps. And uh, for a one in 200 year storm, it would be about 900 amps. We think the Dunedin transformer failed about 100 amps. It's an open engineering question. What is the biggest current that a transformer can, can take? But when you say to the engineers, how about a thousand amps? They go, oh, it would be on fire. That would be really bad. We try and say, well, what's the threshold? That's too hard. But they do have numbers where they can say, no, 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 that's too much. Um, a completely different way of doing it by Malcolm uh, Ingham from Victoria. He went and, and looked and you can see very high peaks across the network. But you can also see long time periods with, with high currents. And that would also cause slow heating and probably eventually damage as well. So that was our first research. Since then, the UN um, Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space, COPUS, has identified that geomagnetically induced currents is probably the biggest space weather risk to people due to the likely extensive damage to property and infrastructure as well as loss of life. And um, I'm just going to skip that. But that sort of information helped us convince MBIE that we should be allowed a endeavor funded program to go away and look at this in more detail in New Zealand with the goal of trying to both understand what the storms would be like and work out what mitigation is possible. And we're working with friends from New Zealand, like Victoria University, the University of Canterbury, GNS, the Target Museum, but also our international colleagues, the British Geological Survey, the British Antarctic Survey, and the University of Texas. I'm going to end, and I am about to end, by telling you what our industrial clients, our industrial partners want to know. Transpower wants to develop a mitigation plan. Ideally, how can they keep the network going during one of these bad events? But if need be, what do they need to know so that they can safely turn off the network for a day or two and then come back after the bad event? And we've still got the electricity network. This requires work, this requires them to spend money, they would like some advice on doing that. So, they would like to know really simple questions. What is the probability of an extreme storm for New Zealand? What would it be like? Ah, sorry. How long would it last when can they return to normal operations? What can be done during an extreme storm? So we have done some very rough estimates for them and they're very rough and we think that only 15% of the transformers would be lost, although I think that's too conservative. That works out at about $1.2 billion a year in, in lost costs. We would want to replace the transformers. I'm confident we would not be at the front of the queue of for the small number of companies in the world who make transformers, because we don't have nuclear weapons to threaten. We're also working with our partners in First Gas, who have a, a network, pipeline network, all over the North Island. Remember, they will also be facing the fact that there are big electric fields and they have conductors under the ground. This is a new thing for them, though. They're not as advanced in transport, transport. They haven't had a transformer burns out, for example. So they'd like to know, what are the voltages and currents that might be expected? Are they bigger than they can handle? Does this matter to them? One thing we had done just a week ago or so was the second anniversary of the Carrington event. And as part of that, we launched our new logo, which was made by uh, Michael, Michael Kerekia, 
from uh, Akura in Gisborne. We had a nationwide competition of all Akura in New Zealand, and that was the logo that came out of it. Isn't it cool? Today, our language week, but it's just cool anyway. Okay, so how likely is a really big geodetic storm? Well, the estimate is that a Carrington class storm will probably happen and strike the world in the next 50 years at about the 30% level. You contrast that with something that we know would be a big issue for New Zealand, like the Southern Alpine Fault. This paper that I found from Science with GNS authors said that there's about a 15% chance. That would be devastating for the South Island. A Carrington event storm would be devastating for large fractions of the world. It's great that we're now all researching these things. Um, lots of different bad space weather would happen in an extreme storm. This is just one of them. Although the committee, the UN committee identified was probably the worst one. And it's important to recognise that it's just another hazard. In many senses, we're lucky in New Zealand because lots of New Zealanders understand that there are these hazards out there, like earthquakes and tsunamis and landfall and extreme winds. We just need to start planning to include space weather in our list. And I always have to fund, thank the people who have funded me over my career, the Marsden Fund, Antarctica New Zealand, the University of Otago, Fulbright New Zealand, the Ministry of Everything, and once upon a time, the European Union sent a couple of hundred thousand euros to the University of Otago for me to do some research. And so I always like to mention that because no New Zealand taxpayers were harmed. Thank you very much for your time. I'm sorry I've gone a little bit over. If you take some questions, that's it. Good on. Hmm. Thank you very much, Greg, for... Uh informative and also very entertaining talk. It's fabulous. Um, so open up the floor for questions. So those of you online, um, uh, the best way um, to probably ask your questions is through the chat. And then um, if we want to, um, uh, either that or you put up your hand, um, uh, show, show your hand in a, and, um, I'll, um, and then unmute yourself. Okay, we've got a couple of questions already online. Cool. So there's um, so they're both from Barry Peak. Um, why are there areas of inhomogeneity in the sun's surface? He would have thought it would be homogeneous. Okay, no, that's a, that's a really it's a really important question. So the sun has this um, very strong field, but because the sun is a ball of gas and not a ball of rock. Um, it's not all spinning at the same at the same speed. So, like if you have a ball of rock or a soccer ball and you spin it, it all spins together because that's what it's, it's solid. But with a ball of gas, the different parts of gas can spin at different speeds. And so, the top of the ball of gas that is the sun is spinning at a different speed than the equator. And that basically means that the magnetic field of the sun, and if you imagine like dipole field lines, get wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and eventually they want to release themselves and you get all this crazy kinkedness in the magnetic field and when they release and reconfigure that's a release of a huge amount of energy and that's the explosion and so it, it's that that's where the inhomogeneity comes from it's a very good question actually okay so we've got another one from barry oh well let's go to frank arthur first yep. um so he says um do we need the um Delta primary transformers at the far end of uh, a far at the far end away from generation, so that the Earth return current cannot enter. Um, um, the, the far issue, end away the, from yeah, generation. Yeah. The issue is it's a voltage mm -hmm. difference between two earthen points, and so if they're very far away, the voltage difference could actually be very high. So I suspect what you would what you would probably want to do is, oh, is have okay. lots and lots of earth and then you'd have small current. Um, but lots and lots of earth comes with other problems. Mm. Holly, did you want to ask a question? Mm. No? I've got a question if you can. Yeah. Please, please Holly. ask away. Yes. Um, well, having given us all the information on how we should worry, um, is there what is going? What thought is going in to protect us, or the Earth, or New Zealand, 
from the power, you know, from the solo activity, which is going to affect our power system. I presume you've brought it to people's attention. There, <laughs> there is a lot of activity happening globally. So um, some of that activity is around trying to predict if the explosions will happen on the sun. There is activity around measure, uh, making sure we can see the explosions when they leave the sun. The European Space Agency is going to put a new spacecraft out there so that we end up with better warning times. Um, and we'll probably get 30 minutes warning. It might be 20 minutes warning that a really big solar tsunami is coming. But that is so much better than an earthquake where it's just going to happen. We've got the possibility of getting a warning. And one of the things that we're working with Transpower is to come up with protocols that would that they could then do with those uh, 20 minutes worth of warning. Thank you for that. Not at all. Okay, so we've got another, um, another um, question from Barry. Pete, Barry, do you want to ask that question or would you like me to do it? You have to unmute yourself. There's also a question in the room. Ah, right. Can you hear me, Craig? Yes. Yes. Um, my question was, given that we've got no control over when a solar event occurs and the magnitude of it, can we design transformers, improve their, their design to better resist um, these effects? My impression is the answer is yes for small ones and possibly no for the biggest. But one thing that I know that um, people are looking at is putting blockers, which are basically big capacitors, on the earth of the transformers. And that is one thing that people are talking about. They probably only cost $50,000 each, um, which is a lot, but you can make a cost-benefit analysis. You can pick which transformers you think are critical, and you can potentially go predict, predict them. So that's the sort of thing that's being thought about. Mm, thank you. So, yeah. if, so if we get, let's say, 20, 30 minutes of warning before this big one hits, if the power network is, I mean, Transpower, for example, is prepared and has a has a procedure where they do a black shutdown, yep. shut down everything. Um, what sort of damage would it with the network ex receive? I mean, would it still get some damage? Would it be would it be damaged badly enough that it couldn't do a black start? If if the transformers are not energized, yeah, they won't be damaged at all. Right. Okay, so, so if they were off, you need an early warning system. You, you want an early warning system, <laughs> and, 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 and that's, you know, that's hundreds of millions of dollars, but it's the sort of thing that both NASA and the European Space Agency are looking at doing, and I think the Russian Space Agency too, because it's a cost-benefit analysis. And um, one thing I should say, though, is I am not aware of many nations that are taking it as seriously as Transpower is right now. I mean, since we gave them some of our calculations as to how big the numbers might be, they went from a, okay, we need to mitigate, we need to have plans for mitigation, but if they're going to be that big, we can't mitigate it. We need to have a response which is a bit COVID-like. We just say, okay, we're switching everything off for a while, look after yourself for two days, we'll be back. Yeah. Um, and we better brief the Prime Minister on, on the sort of decision-making that will have to be made. But, 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 but yeah, as, as we've said, this is unlike the situation of an earthquake. One can provide a warning, and then we have to come up with a plan of what we'll do. But that's what we're trying to do, which is really exciting. Do you have any social scientists on your team? No. That's a big problem. <laughs> because it's not just about telling the Prime Minister, it's about telling people. It's about telling everyone in the country to that this is something they might need to be aware of and prepared for. Cool. Because otherwise Mad Max situations happen, won't they? Ah, oh, we'll be fine. <laughs> New Zealand two days without power. Yeah. So I, I have one um, I'm gonna allow myself the last question. <laughs> so we have um, th there's been these proposals where they talk about um, creating this this huge um, electric grid that basically links Africa and Europe. Um, the idea being that you could 
take the solar from from countries which have great solar, transport it all the way up to um, to Europe where they can use it. Um, on that sort of big scale, <laughs> I guess this this gets even worse than. Um, I mean, I don't know, just, yeah, I suspect operationally it won't be so bad. If you want to transfer power a long way, you do not use an alternating current transport transmission system. You use DC. And like the high voltage DC link that joins the two country, the two two islands of New Zealand. And those systems are basically immune. In fact, if anything, we might get free power from the sun very briefly <laughs> as the sun induces currents on the high, high voltage DC link. But those currents, you know, that whole system is designed for currents to go through it. And so that wouldn't be a problem. It's the AC network and the transformers that are the problem. You might be exposing Africa to more of a risk by putting more electrical energy in there. But in the in the scheme of things, it's probably better to put it in there and then design it so that it's less likely to fail. So should we should all go to DC? That's not the problem. Uh, it might solve the problem, and I know that Nigel's thinking about that, but it, it's very complicated. Yeah. It's, it's hard. Anyway, okay. should we have lunch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's great. And so let's thank um, Craig again for a great talk. And um, thank, you. thank you all online for joining in. Thank you.